Coming up, Sean Hannity talks about his role in the new faith-based film starring Kevin Sorbo. Clinically dead in the ambulance for four minutes. It's a miracle. Plus, one-on-one -on -one with Charlie Daniels, the country music giant speaks his mind. The only two things that protect America are the grace of Almighty God and the United States military. And shares his faith. I wanted everybody to know exactly what I believe. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we welcome our lovely co-hostess, uh, what is your name? <laughs> Terry Music. <laughs> Bill Smith. It's good Bill to be Smith. with all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Smith. Anyhow, uh, Terry's here with us. The nuclear threat from North Korea is now unprecedented. That's not a warning from President Trump. It comes from the defense minister of the nation of Japan. At the same time, North Korea is also capable of causing serious damage in another way by what's called cyber warfare. Well, President Trump is expected to pressure China to take a tougher stand against North Korea when he travels to Asia next month. Dale Hurd brings us the story. With Kim Jong-un's continued nuclear threats against North Korea's neighbors and the U.S., a major Pacific ally has all but endorsed a military strike, if necessary, to stop him. Speaking at the Association of Asian Nations Summit in the Philippines, Japan's defense minister said North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities have grown to an unprecedented, critical, and eminent level that could compel Japan to endorse possible military action. On his way to the conference, Defense Secretary James Mattis said the major nations in the region all agree the Korean Peninsula must be free of nuclear weapons. There's only one country with nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. The UN Security Council's unanimous resolutions give a pretty good idea of how the international community looks at it. Secretary Mattis did not mention military action at the conference, but instead focused on diplomatic pressure. President Trump has said the U.S. will resolve the North Korean problem alone if necessary to prevent Pyongyang from gaining the capability to attack the United States with a nuclear missile. But when he heads to Beijing next month, the president will pressure the Chinese to make good on their vow to tighten the screws on North Korea. China is North Korea's only major ally and accounts for more than 90 percent of North Korean trade. The White House has said China needs to do more. North Korea is a threat to the West in more ways than one. The website MarketWatch reports that North Korean hackers can launch anonymous cyber attacks from various different countries without the risk of retaliation. It says North Korea is now capable of stealing hundreds of millions of dollars a year from just one type of online attack alone. And they can attack digital banks and have even hacked the South Korean Bitcoin exchange, stealing almost a million dollars of the cyber currency. The author claims North Korea's potential to create mayhem on the Internet is almost limitless. And right now, there's not much anyone can do to stop it. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Think of that. Their ability to create chaos is limitless. I tell you what will happen, though. If people begin to hack and they're skilled at it, they can hack the uh, computers of the major banks, of the major credit companies, of the major retailers, and of course, you know what they did to 20th Century Fox, as I recall. It was, was it Fox that they were working on, or was it Sony, excuse me, Sony, uh, the, who were going to do a, a movie about Kim Jong-un, and they hacked them and took away their scripts and so forth. I mean, it's unbelievable what can be done. So it's frightening to think about, but nevertheless, it's real. And sooner or later, we're going to have to do something about it. And we just pray the president will uh, uh, have the wisdom of the Lord and what to do. By the way, uh, he has, is not going, at least he said he's not going to be able to go to the DMZ, which I think is a very smart move because he could be assassinated. He'd go up in that area. and It would take one missile to blow him up. And I think that would be a tragedy. So we don't want to expose our president to something like that. He can uh, sit in a ship off the coast and say everything he's got to say. But by the way, right now, Regent University, listen to this. 
We have a standalone cyber range. It's the leading edge or training uh, tool to provide world-class cybersecurity simulation. And we're going to be offering security operations center training, C-suite executive awareness, information security certification, and we'll offer a BS in cybersecurity, a BS in cyber and digital forensics, and a master of science in cybersecurity. Now that's just what's being done at Regent. We want to train people how to counter the threats, whether they're from North Korea or Russia or any other country. Uh, so it's, it's exciting. We've got the most sophisticated cyber range probably uh, in existence right now, certainly for any university in this, in this country. And it's an exciting thing. So if you want to get some, you know, cutting edge training, Regent University is the place to look. The number, by the way, is 866-910-7615, Regent University. Okay, President Trump is heading to Capitol Hill today to try to get all of the Republican senators on board for cutting taxes. Has he, will he succeed? John Jessup has that. Well, Pat, the president hasn't always gotten along with some of the Republicans in the Senate, like John McCain and more recently Bob Corker of Tennessee. But Trump has been working hard to bring Republicans together to support a tax bill, doing more to sell his plan to the GOP and the public than he did with the repeal of Obamacare. The president considers the tax plan his top priority for the rest of the year. Congressional leaders want to have a bill ready by early November. Well, in addition to cutting taxes, the president is also taking other measures away from the headlines to strengthen the economy by cutting old regulations and not introducing new ones. The government has added an average of 13,000 new restrictions annually for the last 20 years. But under Mr. Trump, the number of new regulations could be close to zero. The Weekly Standard reports that's the finding from the study, from a study rather, from the Mercatus Center, a free market think tank at George Mason University. And Pat, as you well know, various studies have found regulations have cost the economy trillions of dollars. There's no question about it. And, I, you know, he uh, said in an interview that I did with him some time ago that the business leaders he talked to said that the regulations were more burdensome than the taxes. Well, the regulations have been strangling and killing our industry. And to think that under his administration, not one new regulation, and he's been taking off thousands of others. But imagine what's been done year after year after year by these uh, little bureaucrats, like little termites, working throughout the government to slow things down, to kill product, uh, private initiative, and now the president says, no way, we're going to stop that. That is tremendous. I'm, I'm very excited about that. John? Pat, actor and producer Kirk Cameron is putting a national spotlight on faith with a night of prayer and worship right here in Washington. It's called Revive Us 2, and it airs live tonight in theaters across the country. Jenna Browder sat down with Cameron to talk about what's in store. One year ago at Revive Us, over 150,000 believers gathered in theaters across America for a national family meeting. And now Kirk Cameron is back for more. We prayed, we worshiped, we put our faith into action, and something remarkable happened. Ready to shine a light on faith in the nation's capital. So here we are a year later, it's Revive Us 2, and we're meeting because uh, it seems that our nation is very divided. We hear it all the time. We're being divided about race, about religion, about politics, um, about gender, about choice. Uh, we have so many things causing anxiety like hurricanes and wildfires and uh, tragedies in Las Vegas. We need a path to unity. It's happening here at the brand new Museum of the Bible, but you don't have to be here to participate. That's right. So think of it as a giant revival meeting. In, in, you know, they used to have revival meetings in a big white tent somewhere, and the community would come. Well, think of this as 800 tents, but they're movie theaters, all connected through satellite. And just like last year, he's teaming up Join with big names like Ben Carson, Carson Ravi Zacharias, and, and the team behind Henry Fireproof and War Room. There's been a shift in our culture. A fresh momentum is building. You say an awakening is happening in our country. What do you mean by that? 
Well, when the negative narrative floods our news feeds that says we're divided, we're arguing, we're fighting, we're, we're so politicized that we can't move forward, there has been a massive shift in our culture recently. I feel a fresh momentum that's building and an awakening of people who are saying, I can see that what we're trying to do is not working in our country. It's not moving in the direction that we'd hope. And so let's lean into our faith. Let's love God with all of our heart. Cameron says the whole idea for this came to him in the form of an open door. In my walk with God, I've found that whenever I seek to honor God and be a blessing to other people, if that intersects with uh, my acting career or an ability to make a live event or a movie like Revive Us, I want to be all in and I do it with all my heart. And it's that passion he hopes will spread to audiences across the country. It's time for a better and higher perspective. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. And to find out where you can see Revive Us 2 in theaters along with showtimes, just visit our website, cbnnews.com. Pat, back to you. Yeah, Kurt's a great guy. That, that's a wonderful thought. Really is, and that yeah. Bible Museum is opening next month. Oh, and it yeah. looks like that's it. the Green family oh, yes. sponsored that Museum of the Bible. Draw a lot of people they're, to Washington. They're incredible. Okay, what's next? Well, up next, Sean Hannity, as you've never seen him before. The Fox News star talks about his role as movie producer in the film starring Kevin Sorbo, Let There Be Light. Well, Mike, you're watching this uh, edition of the 700 Club, and we're glad you're with us. Faith-based films have been very popular at the box office, proving that Americans want family-friendly movies. Ephraim Graham talks about the latest faith-based film, which hits theaters this Friday. A veteran Hollywood actor teams up with a big name from Fox News Channel to produce a new film called Let There Be Light. The story of a world-renowned atheist, a near-death experience, and an encounter with the creator of the universe. Daddy. Clinically dead in the ambulance for four minutes. It's a miracle. I saw Davy. Well, all I wanted to do was just I wanted to put my arms around him. I, I don't know what to do with him. Fox News host Sean Hannity is the movie's executive producer, his first foray into filmmaking, along with Kevin Sorbo, who not only stars in the film, he also directed it. The movie is a true family affair. Sorbo's wife, Sam, co-wrote the script and also plays his on-screen wife. Their two young sons make their own acting debuts. Let There Be Light opens in theaters around the country Friday, October 27th. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Thanks, Ephraim. Sean is joining us now from New York. And Sean, it's a great to see you again. Uh, Good to see you, Pat. How are you? I'm doing great, brother. Tell me about <laughs> this, this movie thing. Uh, what got you into the movie business? You know, um, I, first of all, I didn't plan it. I can tell you that, Pat. So it got, it was very interesting. God's Not Dead came out, which, which Kevin Sorbo starred in that movie. And I went to the movie and I felt like I had a, a very different experience than the typical Hollywood sex, violence, cartoons, Batman, Superman, Superman 50, you know, Spider-Man 50. And I've always felt that Hollywood has a contempt, if you will, for conservatives, conservative values, Christian conservative values in particular. And I just think they're missing a void. And so I said to Kevin, I said, when I was interviewing him for that movie, I said, if you ever have another project, maybe we can work together. And I don't think it was like two or three days later, he called me and I said, I think I have a project you might like. So Kevin and Sam and a, another gentleman, Dan Gordon, they came to my office and I would say within 20 minutes, we literally had a deal to move forward with the, with the project. And that was about a year and a half or two years ago, Pat. And um, I love this movie. This movie is heart, mind, soul of all the people that I have shown the movie to. We've screened it to a lot of people. Everybody cries. It's very unpredictable. It's an emotional roller coaster. 
um, and, and I'm pretty proud of it. Let me, Kevin is a super guy. He played Hercules. He's a star. Um, uh, what does he do in this movie? Is he the director of it as well? Yeah, well, I would say he's the star in the movie for a lot of different reasons. Kevin in this movie plays an atheist who wrote the book Aborting God. Now, the movie starts out with a lot of the darkness that we all see in the world, a lot of the news that you cover on your show, I cover on my show. And he is an atheist. Then we, we sort of pan to a big crowd. And the crowd is watching this debate. Kevin Sorbo behind him has his book, like, uh, Aborting God. Then you have a, a pastor, a, a Christian minister. And the crowd is all on the atheist side. And as the story begins to unfold, you know, why does this man hate God so much? We begin to understand the details of his life, and it also becomes then a transformation, Pat. But it's got a lot of twists and turns, a lot of unpredictability in it, and you're never going to figure out how this movie ends, which I in particularly like, because I always like go to movies and try to figure out how they're going to end. And, but it, it's one man's journey and how the decisions that he makes as somebody that is part of the, the red carpet culture, the, the glitterati, paparazzi culture, one man's journey from that life of drugs and women and alcohol and abandoning his family into transforming his life and the impact also that all of his decisions had on all of the people in his life throughout all those years that he was living this way. And while, while he has this experience, I won't go into that detail, there is, he's being pulled in both directions because the people around him, it's, this is an industry for him. He's making millions of dollars as he sells his book, Aborting God, being an atheist, being out on the, on the, on the chicken dinner circuit, basically. And so people are trying to pressure him. Oh, come on, we got to keep this up. We got to keep this up. You, you're not really believing this now that you have faith or that maybe this experience has transformed your life. So you watch both sides pulling on this one man. And the great part is it, it impacts you intellectually. It impacts you emotionally. A lot of everybody cried that I know that saw it. And it impacts you spiritually. And I know people that have said to me after the movie, this changed my life. So, um, you're I wish Hollywood this, did more of that, but because they're not, I figured I'd fill, at least start to fill the void. You, you're bringing this out in the middle of this uh, Harvey Weinstein scandal that has rocked Hollywood. Uh, is this getting into that Hollywood uh, milieu to say you'd better shape up and, and, and have a new uh, approach to movie making? You know, what we're trying to do here, this is an independent film, Pat. And that means we didn't get the backing of a Hollywood studio. And frankly, I don't even think we want the backing of a Hollywood studio. And we'll do a different rollout. For example, a lot of movies might, might start in 2,000 theaters, it's $100 million budgets. This feels like a very high budget film. And it wasn't, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that. But what we're doing is we're starting out in a few hundred theaters. Then we're going to expand it to a few hundred more, then a few hundred more. And we're pretty convinced, based on the popularity of the movie and based on the feedback that we've gotten, that a lot of people are going to want to see this. I actually put up on my website, Hannity.com, uh, all the theaters where we are debuting. It opens this Friday. And I think, yeah, I, I would like to see, you know, Hollywood has had one formula. And they've used that now for years. Here's the formula. Sex, violence, cartoons, and Jennifer Aniston falls in love and out of love with somebody else. You know, a different guy in every movie. That's pretty much the whole thing, Pat. Okay. Well, you're, you're exactly right. Let me talk to the national. Uh, you're covering the national story. What do you think about what, uh, what Trump's doing? Are you giving him an A-plus or a B-minus? Or well, how do you rate his presidency? I, I, I will say that the thing that, there's two things I most admire about the president right now. He sticks to his promises. His speeches that he's giving now, the agenda that he's following now is exactly the same agenda that he promised us when he was running on the campaign trail. This is a very important point in his presidency, though, because this economic tax reform plan must pass. And 
I still think what he did executive order wise on health care was good, but I'm still very disappointed that Republicans couldn't keep a seven and a half year pledge to repeal and replace it. With that said, the 1974 law that allows corporations to buy health care plans through associations across state lines, not subject to individual states or the ACA Obamacare mandates, I think that's a good first step. But this economic plan, very simple, all about middle class tax cuts. We're going to go from four, eight brackets to four, corporate tax cuts, repatriation of trillions from multinational corporations, energy independence. And what all that's going to do, Pat, you remember back in the, in the Reagan days, you were part of the Christian coalition. Um, you played a, such a big part in transforming the country at that point in our history. What that means is that, you know, Reagan created 20 million new jobs because all these companies will start building factories, they'll start building manufacturing centers. This election was about the forgotten men and women in this country. And those people need the jobs. We, we have too many Americans in poverty, too many Americans mm -hmm. on food stamps, and too many Americans out of the labor force. We've got to get those jobs back here. You want to comment on Steve Bannon's um, uh, initiative to take out Republican senators, which may uh, destroy the Senate? What do you think? I, I, I think some of them need to go. If Mitch McConnell <laughs> cannot get this tax reform plan over the finish line. He's of no use. He's supposed to lead. You know, I, I, I've been saying on my radio and television shows, Pat, very simple. Put these guys in a room, lock the door, turn off the air conditioner like our founders and framers in the conditions. We'll put them in the conditions they lived in. We'll modernize it a little bit. We'll send in some ice and some Coke and maybe some cold beer and pizza. And these guys got to get together and realize they are there to serve the American people. They're not, with all their vacations and their inability to get things done, I don't really feel like they're serving the American people very well. And when you have 50 million Americans in poverty and 50 million Americans on food stamps and 90 million Americans out of the labor force, um, you ought not be taking vacations. You ought to be rolling up your sleeves, getting in a room, hammering out a deal, and make it something that's going to grow the economy, create jobs, incentivize these businesses. Uh, the president on his own has gotten rid of burdensome regulation. That's good. Let's lower the tax rate so we're competitive, so companies will be incentivized to spend their billions and trillions here, not, not in, in countries overseas. Sean, I, I hope that... Uh... Uh, their honorables are listening to you on this one because I tell you, if they don't get this tax thing uh, passed, uh, they, 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 their uh, majority is is fast fading. I, I don't think it'll, it'll last much longer to you if, if they, they don't get this action done. I, you know, I th I'm more optimistic than I was yesterday, but, you know, I go back to the Reagan years. I'm a trust but verify guy. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a big push now. I'm not so much worried about the House of Representatives. Look, here's the problem in the Senate. There have been 280 bills passed in the House that the Senate hasn't even taken up. And a lot of these are really good bills, like mm -hmm. uh, Kate's Law, about Kate Steinle or sanctuary cities that would, would lose their financial benefit if they don't adhere to federal law. Um, I, they got the health care bill passed. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't what I wanted. But at least they, they dug in and they got the job done and we would have been in a better position. The Senate similarly has not passed. They have not even taken up the nominations of about half of the appointments that the president made. The pres that means Obama holdovers and state deep state bureaucrats are still there. Many of them, I think, are undermining the president and have been from day one. Um, I don't know what it is these guys are doing, but they take vacations for Memorial Day. They're <laughs> gone for most of July, most of August, and they even had a week vacation this past week. And I'm thinking, guys, you're not, you're not getting, there's no sense, you know what's missing, Pat? A sense of urgency. All my life, whether I was a dishwasher at 12 or a cook at 13 or my years in construction or my years, I'm now in the 30th year of my radio program, my 23rd year at Fox, I have a sense of urgency. Uh, when I come into the 700 Club, I have a sense of urgency that I've got, I've got to do my job, Pat. Yeah. Well, you, you're doing it. All right, I guess we're out of time, but uh, Sean, tell me about your movie. When is it released? And uh, you, you said a few screens. It'll expand to maybe a few thousand before it's over. Right. 
We got, I think, 350 theaters it's going to open in this weekend. We'll be expanding out okay. throughout the next number of weekends. Uh, we're in all 50 states. There's a place people can see it. The demand has been really, really high so far. The great thing is, it's not like your typical Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. This is a movie, I think, that touches your heart, your mind, and your soul. And for people that are looking for movies that they can bring their whole family to, get a great message, be highly entertained. Um, and it has a very contemporary feel to it because a lot of what this movie talks about is a lot of what goes on in the country in terms of, of debates, uh, how Christians and conservatives are looked upon in society, how their values are demeaned oftentimes. When you see the opening scene and Kevin, an atheist is debating a Christian pastor, and the crowd is with the atheist. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's ripped right out of the headlines. Mm -hmm. And and when you see the transformation of a guy that's you know drinking too much, doing too many drugs, hanging out with too many models, abandoning his family, and his transformation, which includes a very solid Christian message, it's it's a pretty amazing movie. Um, and then some other things happen, but if I told you that, Pat, people wouldn't have to go. So we want people to go and enjoy the movie and not give the ending away. Well, our, our best wishes to you and my friend Kevin. Kevin's a super guy and a good friend, and I, he'll do a marvelous job. So best wishes, and may this be the first of many, Sean. I hope you... Well, you know, I, we'll see. God willing, I think people will like it. It opens sure. Fridays. The, uh, the theater list is on my website, Hannity.com. And Pat, always good to see you. You you did play a huge part in well, Ronald Reagan's victory and the success of our country back then, and, and we all owe you a debt of gratitude well, for that. You've been a friend for many years, and thank you for that. And yes, we love America, and that's very important. Yes, we do. Well, God bless you. Thanks, Sean Pat. Hannity, good friend. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, it sounds like a great movie, great opportunity to do something fun this weekend and see something that matters. Hey, speaking of a great gr guy and a terrific friend, coming up, the legendary Charlie Daniels talks about his faith. I had heard all my life that Jesus died for your sins. I believed it, but I didn't know how it applied to my salvation. Scott Ross goes one-on-one -on -one with the country music giant. Plus, we have your questions and some honest answers. Ruth asks, why do believers think it's okay to celebrate Halloween? I don't see anything Christian about this holiday. Stay tuned for Pat's answer. It's coming up. for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Ruth, who says, I don't understand all the hoopla over Halloween. Why in the world do people decorate their homes with skulls and witches and look like someone's hanging from a rope? How can this have anything to do with Christianity? I used to work with a pagan person, and they said Halloween is their most sacred day. I personally have hated Halloween ever since I was a small child. I don't see anything Christian about it, so why do Christians celebrate it? Hey, I'm with you. Uh, it, it is a pagan day. It is the day dedicated to Satan, to witches, to goblins, to... Uh, you go back at the, the Druids in the old days, and that trick-or-treating was, I mean, they, 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 they either got food or they burned somebody's they house serious. down or they yeah. killed their animals. I mean, I mean it's, it's a terrible uh, holiday. And, uh, but I tell you, if, if churches want to celebrate, they figure their kids want it regardless, then have a celebration, bob for apples, and mm -hmm. have plenty of candy and whatever you want to do. But leave off the, the witches and the ghouls and the goblins, because this is Satan's day. There's nothing Christian about it, ladies and gentlemen, nothing at all. All right. Okay, this is Guy who says, when someone dies and their spirit leaves their body, could a demon or evil spirit enter the body? Well, they could, but why would they want to? The body's dead. I mean, the, the body, you know, is worth about less than a dollar uh, with the compo uh, composite uh, elements. There's nothing left in the body. I mean, it's dead. It's just, a, it's just an, an old shell. So, yes, a demon could enter it, but why would they want to? The body's dead. All right. 
Yeah, this is Jacqueline who says, is it okay for females to wear trousers, polish their nails, and have hair extensions? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know why I'm supposed to answer that question. But, carefully. Uh, <laughs> carefully. <laughs> I have no problem with women wearing pants and uh, having hair extensions and all this stuff. You know, sooner or later, though, we've got to get back to the point that uh, uh, women should dress modestly and not try to adorn themselves. And w what we have right now are so many suggestive-looking costumes, and men are stimulated by visual images. And they look at a semi-naked woman, these bikinis, I mean, how revealing can you get? And uh, you see uh, Victoria's Secret and all of those stuff. Um, and, you know, it, it's a come on to men. And, uh, you know, it, it's an invitation for uh, sexual activity beyond what somebody thinks. So back to the pants thing, I, I don't see anything wrong with pants and so the rest of it. but. I, th I think what we need to do is to, you know, adorn ourselves with modesty and, and righteousness. That's what the Bible calls for, not an outward display of, of uh, stuff like hair extensions. Mm -hmm. All right. This is George who says, Pat, why are you so supportive of the Kurds when their forces have prevented shipments of aid going to Christians in northern Iraq and blocked the same Christians from returning to their former homes? Am I missing something? Uh, I think you are missing something. I don't know if the Kurds did, did any such thing. All I know from the Kurds is they have a wonderful society uh, in the Erbil area and around Kirkuk. And they are strong friends of ours, and they are supportive of, of Christianity. They are not part of the militant Islam. And uh, I, I don't know where you've heard of them blocking mm -hmm. Christians. Yeah, if, I, if, I, I don't know anything about that, but I, I find it very hard to believe that they've ever done any such thing. All right. okay, this is Joyce who says, Dear Pat, I've heard that as a believer, I have the power to cast forth the devil and the forces of evil from my house and from my family. I've done this constantly, and nothing has changed. Does that mean I'm not a true Christian and that I'm not saved? Well, nothing's changed. Maybe you didn't have demons to start with. I don't yeah. know. I really don't. But we have the power in our um, mouth to take control of demonic forces. And the word is, I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil, and cast you forth. And Satan must obey. But you remember that case in the Bible where those uh, Jewish uh, charlatans were trying to cast out a demon. They said, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. And the demon said, we know Jesus, and we know Paul, but who are you? And they dumped on, jumped on these guys and beat them up. So uh, I, I think that uh, the question is, uh, are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? If you are, then you have authority over demonic power. But if you're not, then it won't happen. So I, I, don't, I don't know about you. I don't know about you know, who you're dealing with. But I do know that we, who are filled with the Spirit, have authority over Satan, and he must obey us. He must obey the name of Jesus. He must do it. Okay. That's all the time we have for today. All right. Charlie Daniels, a dear friend of mine, he was here on the show with us, and we've got to follow up on that. He's had a storied career in the entertainment business that has scanned decades. His enduring talent keeps him on the concert tour year after year, even though he's close to my age. He's 80 years old. But he's never shy about speaking his mind. Charlie sat down with our Scott Ross to just think about his music, his faith, and his strong sense of patriotism. Here they are. The legendary Charlie Daniels is best known for his platinum single, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. I sat down with him recently to discuss his latest book, a memoir of his life on the way to becoming one of the most iconic figures in music. The title of the book, Never Look at the Empty Seats. Yes. What's that? It is a nod to accentuate the positive. When you're a young musician, if you're 
if you're serious about trying to make something out of yourself, and I was and am, you'll play for anything they'll give you, anywhere they'll let you play for anybody that shows up. Mm-hmm. You concentrate on them and you entertain them. And the next time that you come back to town, there's a good possibility they'll come back and bring somebody else with them. And that's how you build a following. Born in 1936, Charlie was 19 when he decided music was his calling. He taught himself how to play guitar, fiddle, and several other musical instruments. Although mostly known as a Southern rock and country artist, his writing is influenced by many different styles, starting with the music of his youth. I remember when it was big bands, when it was uh, uh, Benny Goodman and Harry James and all those guys, you know, and Frank Sinatra and, and the crooners and those people. And it went from that into Fats Domino and Little Richard and, you know, Elvis Presley came along, turned the world completely upside down. And then, you know, I, I had heard so much music by the time I got ready to do original music that some of all of it kind of filters into my creative process and it tends to come out within the bounds of a song. Mm-hmm. Maybe two or three different styles all in the same song. Charlie was far from an overnight success. He spent two decades as an unknown playing for other bands and artists before forming the Charlie Daniels Band in 1970 that became one of country rock's most influential bands. During that time, Charlie learned to hold on to his Christian faith, even though at times it was hanging by a thread. Uh, The man of God, how did that start? I mean, when the God consciousness? You know, I wrote a... I wrote a chapter in that book on that, and it was the hardest chapter that I wrote. The reason being, I went through a lot of changes in my faith. I've gone through scores of of just turning this way and turning that way and turning the other way, and I finally decided one day, I don't know what to believe. I had heard all my life, Jesus died for your sins. I believed it, but I didn't know how it applied to my salvation. I didn't know why it had to be that way. I did not understand it because mm-hmm. you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't just go out and get it. And and I I wanted everybody to know exactly what I had gone through and exactly you know what I believed. In fact, Pentecostal gospel music has always been a major influence on Charlie's writing, but often it's not the music that inspires him. He's a patriot who loves his country and respects those who serve. I'm firmly convinced that the only two things that protect America are the grace of Almighty God and the United States military. Really? Another thing that affects your writing are are world events. You're very, you're you're kind of an opinionated guy. I am an opinionated guy. I noticed that a few times. (laughs) (laughs) Some people like it, some people don't. Recent events, okay, let's Mm -hmm. say Racism, which is not recent, mm-hmm. but Charlottesville, when this goes mm-hmm. to air, of course, that'll be months behind us. But the kinds of th- th- things like that, does that affect your thinking? It affects my heart. I hate to see this nation divided like it is right now. Yeah. It really, really bothers me. Of all the things, if I could wish one thing mm. besides that everybody was saved, yeah. My next thing would be, why can't we all just get along? Yeah. Why do we have to have all this stuff? Why do we listen to all the negative things and draw our conclusions, and then we get together and we can't even sit down and talk? That's stupid. I can sit down and talk to anybody if they're willing to talk to me. Charlie has won several music awards, and in 2016 was honored to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And even at 80 years old, With concerts booked well into 2018, Charlie says he is ready to keep entertaining his friends on stages across the country. Do you ever get tired of just doing that? My opportunity, my blessing that I get to get up on stage every night and entertain people with music that I have created. To steal a title from some other writers, Lennon McCartney, it's been a long and winding road. It has been. Where do you go from here? What, what's it in mind for you? Get on that bus, hit the road. I keep doing the same things that, that, uh, that I'm doing now. I intend to write another book. Really? The epitome is getting on stage in front of people and playing music you've created. I'm addicted to that. That's my thing. That's what I do. All these other things are peripheral things around that. The honor 
of being able to perform. I love it. I literally love it. I love walking out on stage and, and playing music for people. Oh, he's a great guy, isn't he? Well, for more Charlie Daniels, get his book. It's called Never Look at the Empty Seats. I talked to him about what that means. <laughs> And uh, that book is in stores, uh, bookstores uh, nationwide. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, terrific guy, Charlie Daniels, one of the, well, he's in the rock, I mean, he's in the country hall of fame. Hall of fame, great career, and just yeah. a really wonderful down to earth. Very sincere, just loves mm -hmm. the Lord, and he's the one. <laughs> you know, I was reading about that devil went down to Georgia, and that's the song that he's made famous, but. The guy that wrote it, he, he gave a description of how he did it. He kind of put it together, uh, you know, a little piece by piece by piece uh, to get that uh, southern sound. and uh, It worked. <laughs> it worked. It absolutely worked. Okay. Well, up next, a young woman remembers the murder she witnessed when she was only five years old. I saw my dad with a gun, and he had it pointed to my mom, and he started shooting, and I didn't know if he was going to hurt me, too. I was really scared, and I just hit under the bed. Watch what happened next when we return. Wow. Welcome back to the 700 Club. They're calling it the largest fire cleanup in California history. Officials want to remove dangerous materials and ash from the 8,400 homes and other structures that were scorched in those awful Northern California wildfires. The state hopes to finish the cleanup early next year so owners can start rebuilding. A Pennsylvania woman celebrated her 94th birthday in a very unusual way. She went skydiving with her granddaughter and great-granddaughter. Aliyah Campbell explained why she decided to jump 10,000 feet. This year when I'm going to be this age, this old, I figured I'll never make it for another year. Better do it now. The free fall is kind of a wow, you know, and the wind is so terrific. It was great. I loved it. And I'll do it again. It's one brave lady. Well, the owner of the Skydiving Center says she's never seen anyone quite as old as Campbell do the jump. Good for her. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Hey, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club, and we've got more for you that I hope you enjoy. Five-year-old Valerie Navarez had never even heard her daddy raise his voice until the night that she peeked around a corner and watched as her dear daddy murdered her mother. No! You don't tell me what to do! really late at night. I heard my mom and my dad arguing. Um, it just sounded really angry. And my mom, she sounded scared. Valerie Navarez was a daddy's girl. At five years old, she'd never heard her father yell before and never would again. I came out of my room. I peeked around the corner and kind of was looking through the door. And I saw my dad with a gun and he had it pointed to my mom he started shooting and i didn't know if he was going to hurt me too i was really scared and i ran back into my room and i just hit under the bed until i didn't hear anything anymore and i took my flashlight and i i just kind of looked around and i didn't see them. The only thing that was left was the blood. And I don't think I understood what really happened. I was still expecting them to come back for me. Police followed the trail of blood to a nearby ravine where they found the body of Valerie's mother. Later, her father took his own life. Meanwhile, Valerie was moved out of state to live with her mother's family, which wasn't easy. 
nobody really knew how to act around me. And I feel like a lot of people just took out their anger on me because I think I reminded them of my dad. Flashbacks and nightmares followed, along with lots of questions. I wanted to know why my dad would leave me like that and why he would, why he would hurt my mom. I was so angry. I felt really depressed. I was just always sad. Kids would tease me about not having my parents. My dad was crazy because he killed my mom. I remember thinking, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to live. By the sixth grade, she had started using drugs and drinking alcohol to numb the pain of abandonment and betrayal. Soon, she started having sex, hoping that would give her the love and acceptance she longed for. I didn't want to keep feeling alone and just empty. I felt empty. Then at 16, she had a baby girl. It felt like I was going to be able to have something of my own. And so I, I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. I, and I just wanted to be the best mom that I could. After being a single mother for a couple of years, Valerie met the man she'd marry. Knowing that they'd need help as a young family, they started going to church. We decided that we needed to go to church if we were going to make it. And they would always ask for people to come for prayer. And I remember him just crying, just feeling a release. But Valerie was still holding on to the pain, anger, and disappointment of her past. Then finally, after spending many times in prayer, she decided to trust Jesus and let it all go. And I just remember going to the altar and just crying and saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm ready. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you need to take from me, whatever I need to do, I'm, I'm, I'm yours, I'm ready. When I gave my life to God, I, I felt I felt like I had, I had the best father. Like I had a dad that would never betray me. I just had the assurance that everything was gonna be okay. And it was like he was telling me like, I never left you. I was your father the whole time, even when you were by yourself. I've always been there with you. Like, you're not an orphan. Afterwards, Valerie was diligent in reading her Bible. God began to do a miracle in my life. He began to take away the anger. It, it wasn't an overnight process, but God had restored my life. He gave me everything that I needed. Later, her husband walked out, bringing back familiar feelings of betrayal, abandonment, and loneliness. It was a very difficult season for Valerie, but ultimately she came through it trusting God more than ever before. I just started praying and I started fasting and I started spending my time just getting closer to him. He always heard my cry. He was the only one at rock bottom. Just like he says in his word, he overcame the world. He's been there too. He overcame all of that and he, he's gonna help us to, to overcome everything that we go through. Valerie is now happily married to Ricardo and owns and operates a clothing company called Overcomer Apparel. She never misses an opportunity to tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. She says it's so good. He's so good. You can cry out to him and he'll hear you on the instant where you're at. He can take a murder-suicide, he can take a divorce, and he can turn it all around and he can still work it for your good. If God could change my life around, if he could give me hope, he can do it for anybody. You know, we all have troubles. This, that's part of life. There isn't one person that isn't having some sorrow that if you are alive as a human being in this world, you have had pain and suffering somewhere along the way. It may be a minor thing. It may be serious like watching your, one of your parents killed, but nevertheless, the thing that Valerie did finally was she took that and she handed it off to Jesus. And then when another tragedy came in her life, she turned to the Lord and then made the right decision because he was with her. 
And he said to her, like I say to you, he'll never leave you. And he said to her, I've never left you. I've been with you the whole time. I'm always there with you. And the nice thing about God is that he loves you and he loves me. And the tragedies of life, he knows we were all suffering. We've all had sickness. We've all had the loss of a loved one. We've all had something in our lives that we can point to that is pain. That's part of living. We live in, in a world that is full of sickness and pain and death and trouble. No question about it. But God Almighty says to you and me, if you trust me, I am with you. Now, I want you to reach out your hand right now and take him. And I mean symbolically rather than literally. Reach out to Jesus right now. And as I pray, you pray with me, Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Pray with me. I know that you are with me. And I receive you right now as my Savior and my Lord. I acknowledge your presence and I acknowledge your love. And at this moment, I say to you, Lord, I am yours. Thank you that you are mine. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you something. It's called a new day. Get you started in the Christian life. I'll give this to you. Just pick up the telephone and call 1 800 700 7000. It's easy to remember. We leave you with our power minute from Psalm uh, 50, uh, what is it? 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye bye.